This is Unexpected with Hannah Love. In this podcast, you will gain a new perspective of how God loves you enough to call you to things that you couldn't have imagined for yourself. Hello, everybody, and welcome my sweet friend, Kristen Young. Kristen, we met five years ago, um, which is crazy. I was like doing the math. It was before either of us were pregnant. I'm pretty sure Ames and your third, I think they were born on the same day, maybe? Yeah, that's right. Judah, yeah. Gosh, I can't believe it's been five years. It's been so fun to keep up with you on Instagram. And what's been so fun is that people send me your stuff all the time. Like not knowing <laughs> that really? I'm like, <laughs> That's funny. I'm like, yeah, the algorithm knows me, but also I know her and hundred percent. So glad that I finally got you on. We have just been juggling that mom life. I'm pretty sure I've reached out to you like once every couple of years for the last two years. So I'm glad we finally made this work. <laughs> I can't believe it's been five years. Has it really been that long? And then that our babies, our 2020 babies are already a four. Four. Like that's insane. Yeah, it's, it's wild. Okay. So for everyone that doesn't know, and I hope you do, I hope that Kristen's all over your algorithm because she is on mine, <laughs> but I'm also down a lot of the trails. Kristen is a mom of five, and we met five years ago at a conference, a women's conference, and um, I just love how God orchestrates the people that he places in your life, and I have loved, Kristen, watching you minister to women online and like build this community of women and speak the truth, even in the midst of having five babies, homeschooling, and now homesteading. So I, I'm so excited to dive into all of this. But first, I want to throw it over to you and let you share a little bit of your testimony, or all of your, te- the whole thing. Share as much as the Lord wants you to share. I am I have prayed over this, and I know that Holy Spirit's going to lead, and it's going to meet who it needs to meet today. I love it. Well, I feel like there's a lot that I could share. So I will start with just my personal testimony with the Lord and then kind of, I guess, overview of how we got to where we are now. I'll try to make it bite size. So, cause I could talk for hours about things. My dad is a pastor. So I ra- I was raised in a Christian home and we were in church all the time. Like anytime the doors were open, I sat under the teaching of my dad and he was a great expositional teacher. So I heard the whole counsel of God's word growing up and um, my parents did a really good job of discipling us at home as well. And so I've always kind of had a love for apologetics, for reading scripture. And I say always had had a love. There definitely were times that were, you know, roller coaster, like ups and downs. Mm -hmm. But I gave my life to the Lord when I was six, but it was not until after my freshman year of college, whenever I worked at a camp called Sky Ranch in the summer between my college years. And it was at staff training in May of, I guess it was 2011, that God just, I mean, wrecked me, like met me where I was and just was basically told me like, Kristen, I'm going to show you what it looks like to really follow me. And from that moment on, like that was such a pivotal moment of like him igniting the spark that was already in me. I already had the Holy Spirit living inside of me because I was a believer, but that was when my faith really took a turn of like, I am going to make my faith my own. Like it's not my parents anymore. Like I'm in, I'm in college now and what do I believe? And, and so from that moment on, I started to just have a deep love for the Lord. I just had a deep uh, desire for reading his word for, I mean, just tearing it up cover to cover, just what I could read, how I could read. And just, I was really on fire for the Lord. And so he was working on me a ton during my college years. And I kept going back every summer to work at Sky Ranch where God had changed my life. And during college, there were there were a couple of semesters that I just really did not have great biblical community. And so that was really challenging to figure out how to walk with the Lord whenever your immediate circle of friends is not walking with the Lord. But God used that season of life. And I feel like I strayed and then God brought me back. It was in March, I remember, of my sophomore year. And God was like, Kristen, what are you doing? Like, what are you doing running away from me? 
And so he just convicted me so strongly. And so from that moment on, like I just continued to just have a hunger for God's word and just for biblical community. And so the second half of my college years look way different than the first half of my college years because God just continued to grow me. And he just brought some really sweet biblical friendships and deep community the second half of my college years. So that's kind of my faith journey, like my background in a nutshell. Obviously, a lot of details are left out because there's, you know, that's just the fly overview. And so I met my husband in college. We went to Washita Baptist University. So for some people, that will probably sound made up. It's in a tiny little town in Arkansas called Arkadelphia. And that will also really sound fictional to people. Um, they're like, you went to where in where? So we went to this small little Baptist college in Arkansas. And we met there. We ended up getting married like right after we graduated. So we graduated in May. We got married in July. And then we went to work for a restaurant, like a restaurant industry. And we never had experience in the restaurant ever. It just was where God led us. And it was a restaurant that had a mission. And so we went and did that. And it was tacos. So, you know, it was like really good food. So we did that. And then we lived in Fayetteville, Arkansas, and then we moved back to Central Arkansas. And actually, this is a really big part of our story as a married couple is, and my husband wouldn't mind sharing this because he's shared it publicly as well. But so the first several years of our marriage was a very difficult. We are both mm-hmm. really hard-headed, very strong-willed, both leaders. And we also were, were just working a lot. And so there was a lot of just like coming into a marriage of thinking like, oh, like you don't like things the way that I like them. And I like things this way. Well, not everything can be my way or this way. And so finding the middle ground and compromising. Um, but then also kind of underneath it all, Um, My husband was struggling with alcoholism. And so that provided a mountain of challenges that I honestly did not expect or even really think that I would walk through in marriage. That really took a lot of, of the Lord having to work in me, of me having to realize that I cannot control somebody else as much as I wanted to control decisions. Mm -hmm. And like, as much as I wanted to control that, because I saw the detriment that it was bringing to him and our relationship. And this is before we had kids. So anyway, so the Lord just really in that started working in me. I was not always a very kind wife. I was very angry a lot of the times and God just started working on that a lot. And in the middle of that, we ended up getting pregnant with our first and um, he's now eight, a little, little older than eight. He, we got pregnant with her first and ended up having him. And he was about, let's see, he was a little bit over a year old. And so that whole year I had been talking to a couple of friends and I had been praying about it. And I was just like, God, like I just started praying really bold. Like I just started praying really bold because it was such a point of contention and it was, our marriage was so mm-hmm. rocky and just like, we argue like cats and dogs all the time. It felt like, and 97% of it really came back to this alcoholism. And, and also just my need for control. And I mean, just, it just was, there was just a lot there. And so I just started praying. I was like, God, can you just work on my heart and help me forgive? And then can you also just take this alcoholism from Justin, no matter what it takes? Like, can you just remove it? Like I'm ready to walk through whatever we have to walk through for you to remove this from our marriage, like for for you to remove this from our life and like free Justin from this. And I wrote it in my journal. Like I wrote my prayers. I was like, God, and it's funny. We kind of joke about it now. I didn't feel funny at the time, but we kind of joke about it now. Is that I wrote in my journal almost two weeks to the day, God, would you just do whatever it takes to rid Justin of alcoholism, even if it takes losing his job? So two weeks later, some stuff just happened with work and it ended up that he lost his job due to alcoholism. Um, And I was like, God, (laughs) you really did listen to that. And so (laughs) Justin ended up losing his job. This was the end of 2017. And this was a place that like the owners were our best friends. We thought we were going to retire there. Like this was a place that we had poured our heart and soul and sweat and blood and tears like all into it. And so it's like he came home that night and he told me everything and we just cried together. And 
there was a lot of healing that happened that night and I mean, and a lot of, you know, brokenness that happened that night. Um, but so that was the night that God really broke our world, like, like really just shattered a lot of things in the best way possible. And then that was when the rebuilding process started after that. And so, so all of 2018, we had our second baby. So she was born in May of 2018. In May of 2018, God was growing me, God was growing Justin, and we, for the first time, had this renewed sense of like what it was like to be a team in marriage, like to have a unified mission, like to be transparent with each other, to have open communication. And so that was really, and and after we had our second born, that was really where God started to unify us in our love for family and for raising children and for discipling them and for marriage, like other marriages and other families. And just, just this whole concept of like a biblical family unit. And so that was really out of the depths of despair. It felt like was where God started to rebuild us and started to change our hearts to be focused on what we actually like to, what we're focused on now. And so over the years, God continued to grow our faith strengthen us, you know, challenge us. There was a lot of healing that took place. You know, we did counseling. We did just continuing to, to work through the hurt and and just all of that that came with it. And eventually, you know, God started to change our hearts with wanting to like live out on land and, you know, do the whole homestead thing. And which is funny because neither of us grew up on land. Neither of us have like farming background. Like I used to want to go to like, like move back to the Dallas area and, live, you know, like work at a PR firm and like live in the, you know, live in an apartment in Dallas. And it's funny because God just has over, I mean, he really took that time and like he started to rebuild us and he changed our hearts, started working on them. And so that's why we started having kids and we we're like, well, you know, however many God gives us. And so we never thought we would have five kids. I never thought I would homeschool. I never thought that I would have to Google how to keep chickens or cows alive, you know? And so anyway, so eventually we ended up moving out. We built a house, moved out on land. And so now we're doing like the whole garden, cows, chickens, homestead kind of thing. And a homeschool. I mean, literally, if you were to tell me five or six years ago, what our life would look like right now, I would have probably laughed in your face. So God is funny in the way that he works. That is so funny. You know, I want to bring it back because I just think that there's so many important pieces. And, and you know, I, a lot of your story is similar to my story. And I think a lot of probably young married people experience this, not only in the first few years, just trying to figure out how it's supposed to work. You are supposed to become one. You're supposed to become a team. You're supposed to figure out how to communicate. You're supposed to figure out all of these things. But then you you throw in an obstacle like that. Um, and Shay and I, I mean, we were really thrown into the deep end too. And it it wasn't alcoholism per se, but that was his escape was, was drinking. Yeah. So when that is a means of escapism and then you as a wife feel like you've lost control, I mean, it really takes you to a place where you're like, I can't do this. I can't make choices for you. Like I can be on my knees for you. And then that escalates when you have babies. Um, and I think God and his goodness knows that in those early years with babies, the babies won't remember. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like mm -hmm. I think about yes. it all that first few years with Asher and even Ames, like that they won't remember a lot of the unhealthy parts. And God was like using those years to work that out of both of us. Mm -hmm. And for me, a lot of it was the control and being like, I can't change his life. I can't change his mind. I can't make his choices, but I can give him to you. Like, holy, I can surrender this to you. And I love the prayer that you prayed because I actually remember my sister-in-law sharing part of her testimony and saying a prayer that she prayed. And she was like, one of the hardest things you can do, but you can ask God to shine light in all the dark places. Yeah, And it's mm -hmm. essentially saying, God, you have to do whatever you have to reveal whatever you have to strip away mm -hmm. that is so difficult especially for a wife because you have to think as a wife here we are feeling like we're not a part of the problem <laughs> when it's an issue like this we're like we're doing everything we know to do to help you know or are mm -hmm. we enabling but we are one now 
because that's how God made us. And so to lay that down and to say, God, break us how you need to break us. Because at this point, it's not you going, God, break my husband the way you need to break him. I mean, maybe I've prayed that before, but for the most part, it was do what you need to do Mm -hmm. to get us to where you want us to be, God. And that's so painful because we're half of the equation. And just in losing his job for you was you didn't have that income and you had babies to take care of and, you know, he's the provider. And so that came with its own issues, but you still gave that over to God. And I love it in that, like, you're not sitting here talking about what a hard time that was. You're talking about how it was in that broken place that God met you and began to rebuild the marriage that you were supposed to have all along. I just think it's so beautiful. And I also think, and this is one soapbox that I can get on, but I think that oftentimes our generation and younger has been sold this, I don't want to say lie, but they've been sold this this idea of, of glamorizing marriage and how easy and quick and convenient it is to get a divorce as soon as things get hard and I just it really like it really truly breaks my heart because I know that those are the places that God will take you through Mm -hmm. to get to the other side to see the fruit of of a life together and I just really like it really gripes me to see the narrative that's being spun in mainstream media about you know, all these young girls and how they're free now and they can live their life and they can live their truth. I mean, it just like makes me want to be like, (laughs) there's, yes, there's probably like a ton of soapboxes. Yes. But I think what you said was so good because, you know, I I remember before we got married, I mean, I actually, I feel like heard this growing up is that marriage is not for your happiness. It's for your holiness. Now, you are happy, you know, a lot of times in marriage, like marriage does bring happiness, but marriage is not always happiness. You know, you've been married five, six, seven, ten 10 years, or even, you know, 30 years or couples that have been married 50 years. And I guarantee every single couple is going to say that there were seasons of life where they were not necessarily happy, or maybe they didn't even really necessarily like the other spouse. They loved them. Like our, there have been seasons of our marriage where I have loved Justin, where I have deeply loved him and knew that God gave him to me as my husband, but I did not like it. And that's, you know, that's, that's nothing that's new. Like that, you know, Justin, I've told that to Justin, we've had those conversations of like, I didn't like it. Like I I remember being, and this is, this actually reveals more about my heart than it did about any circumstance. But I remember being bitter at God when it was like in the worst of the worst time. This was before God got a hold of Justin. It was like when it was so dark and so just God, is this marriage? Like, is this what it is? Like, I remember asking God, like, is this what it is? And now, you know, we did, we had really good times together. Like, that's not to say like, oh, our whole marriage was terrible. But, but I remember stepping back and thinking like, God, is marriage? Like, is this what it is? Because I am not comfortable. Like, I'm not comfortable, like not comfortable in the sense of like feeling safe, but like, it was not an easy, like it wasn't easy. It wasn't comfortable. Like it was, it was hard. It was stretching. And I think what you said is like, so many people are just so quick to just like jump ship whenever marriage looks like that. But when we realize that it is for our holiness and for our sanctification and for God's glory, because marriage is to be a picture of his relationship with his church, like with Christ's relationship with the church is that there are a lot of things in husbands and wives that have to be worked out that are like absolute sandpaper. Like it's not going to just be strawberry fields and, you know, roses and everything. Like if you are going, if we are going to be made in the image of Christ, it is going to take some really hard rubbing against to get out the yuck you know, just to get out this stuff. And so, yeah, it's like people, I feel like are sold 
the idea that like marriage is for happiness or, you know, you have this whole like almost like this feminism kind of narrative going through. It's like, if he's not making you happy, like get out. Or if like he makes a mistake, like get out. But I think as women, we need to realize like a lot of times we are a huge part of the problem. Right. That control piece. Like, yes. That it was just there. There was a lot of, you know, like even just like our respect, like my respect towards him my, like the way I spoke to him, be, trying to be controlling, like all of that was super, like that was my own sin. Like were circumstances not easy and it was easy for sin to come out? Yeah. You know, like it wasn't easy, uh, but that was still my own sin. And I can't blame my sin on him because it's my sin and it just looks different than his. Right. That's so good. I mean, I love that you're bringing this out because I do feel like a lot of my listeners are, they're young or, you know, they're, they're in early marriage or maybe they're just out of college. Um, and I also love that you brought up that, you know, your personal relationship with Christ began really in, in college where you made that choice where you're like, this is me and this is my relationship and I'm not doing it because it's what my parents told me to do, but I'm pursuing it myself. I feel like that age, and I've brought this out a lot in a lot of interviews that I've done, but it seems that especially for women, I don't know, I can't speak for men, but that time frame finding, I don't want to say finding yourself because that makes me want to roll my eyes, but <laughs> finding your footing with God mm -hmm. and finding your relationship yeah. with God. And determining in your own independence and and using your free will to say I'm going to pursue this with you God and I feel like it comes in that time frame somewhere between when college starts and when college ends and you're out in the real world trying to figure it out and you're you're floundering or you're falling on your face or you're like the most broken and lost you've ever been because now you're in the real world <laughs> now you mm -hmm, have to yeah. have your own values and your own compass and and actually what you find is what that compass should look like is the word and God mm -hmm. and where he is leading yeah. and guiding you versus like following something that you've been sold or some self-help book out there well how about now how was the move I've been following along how was the move <laughs> to the land and did this take some like move of God or were you and Justin both on the same page the whole way through or were you, was it like in the back of your mind that you wanted to kind of like pursue this and then you just like prayed Justin into it? Tell me how this happened. <laughs> <laughs> he jokes about this, about how I'm like several years ahead of him in certain things, like not smarter than, but just like, you know, in, in topics to talk about or like, Hey, have you ever thought about this way? Or I get, and I get really passionate about things. And so it, it actually has probably been eight years in the making, although I didn't, and I didn't realize that's what it was going to turn into eight years ago, or I didn't realize that this is what it's going to turn into eight years ago. So like eight years ago, I started learning about, you know, like food ingredients and all that kind of stuff. Like I started learning about, you know, toxins and, you know, what's in our food? Like that was the whole thing. That was my lot in life to learn about. You were in the restaurant industry. So you had a front row seat. Yes. And so it, it was when I, is when we had our first baby and I had time when I was nursing to just learn. And so I started learning about food ingredients, you know, makeup ingredients, household clean. I mean, literally one thing led to the next. And so mm -hmm. So over the years, it was like kind of more of, you know, trying to switch to more natural things and trying to, you know, kind of eliminate toxins and kind of eat more whole foods and organic and, you know, this, this kind of whole thing. So little did I know that asking those questions and learning about food ingredients would lead us to having a dairy cow. I, I had no idea. Like I always joke about how like that should come with a warning label because now we're on a homestead. All I was learning back then was just ingredients. And now we're, you know like a huge garden deep into this. And so anyway, like I, you know, really it began then. And so I just, you know, kind of started learning about that. And so that was when I kind of started to 
try shopping for more whole foods and, you know, vegetables and fruit and learning about all that. And so, I mean, honestly, it kind of is just snowballed. And so we actually bought our land at the end of 2020. We had been looking Perfect. that whole year. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect timing. It was great timing. We had, I think we had started probably looking in 2019, maybe the end of 2019. So we had looked for a good seven, eight months, maybe, you know, like constantly scrolling Zillow. And we had in our mind that we wanted to build, but we were also okay with like, if we found something that was just perfect for us, that we would, you know, buy something with land. So we, I, I put the bug in Justin's ear, I guess a little bit before that. And I was like, you know, what if like we kind of, you know, what if we had land and then 2020 kind of rolled around and he was like, yeah, like we should, we should look at land. We should, we should figure it out. 2020 was kind of the push to get him on board. And so I, I really didn't have to do a lot of convincing. You know, I was, I just, you know, I was like, well, what if we could, you know, grow our own food? And I think that the, it was, and I think that this probably had an effect on a lot of people too, in the same way, but it was the whole idea of like the shortages. Like when you, you know, when we, you couldn't get toilet paper, like you couldn't get certain things and, you know, realizing how much we relied on just how much we were reliant on other people and just the systems and in, in place. And so we started looking at that and Justin started realizing that and we we're like, yeah, I think that we want to be more self-sufficient because, you know, we would have been dead yesterday. Like if we, like if we didn't have, you know, like if we didn't know, like we, we if anything were to happen, we realize like, we don't like, we're not prepared for anything. Like we don't have anything at all. And so that was kind of the push that was like, okay, like, I think that we should look for land. We should start looking. We you know, can do a garden. And like I said, we had no experience at all, but we just started looking and we had the, the piece of land that we live on. We had actually scrolled past it several times because of the address and it looked like it was going to be way too far out. And so months went by and eventually I kept, I saw it again and I, I just, I looked at it and I put it in my maps and I was like, oh, like that's actually not that far from where we do life right now anyways. Like it was, you know, not, not that far at all. It's like a very doable driving distance. And so we realized that it wasn't as far out as we thought. And so I sent it to him and I was like, let's just like, let's just go look at it. We ended up going to look at the land and it, I mean, the first step on the land and we were like, this is it, this is it. And we had been looking for a while. And so we ended up buying the land at the end of 2020 and we had to put build, we weren't able to build yet because of all the prices, you know, skyrocketing and everything just kind of being crazy and everything being, you know, no supply chain issues and stuff. So we, I think about a year we had to put it on hold. And so, but we would come out to the land and, you know, play and ride four wheelers and that kind of stuff. And so anyway, we ended up having, you know, ended up being able to uh, pull the trigger on building. And so, we, December will be two years since we've been out here. So yeah, it would, I would say it was a progression of Justin kind of getting on board with all the like, you know, food ingredients and, and all that kind of stuff. And then eventually he kind of started seeing it a little bit and then 2020 happened. And then we were like, yeah, we should kind of be out on land. And so really ever since 2020, we kind of just started having the same kind of dream together and except the dairy cow, he probably could go without the dairy cow, which she's not, she's not in, she's not in milk yet, but that was a dream that I had. And he was like, as long as you milk her. And I was like, deal, that's fine. And so anyway, it's just, it's been funny because as we've gotten out here, Justin and I are very like, like, if we're going to do it, let's do it. And so we moved out here in December of 2022. And then that April, like that March and April, we like, planted our garden, got a bunch of chickens. Like, I mean, did a lot like at the very beginning. And so anyway, so now it's, a, now it's really fun because we have this shared mission and passion of like gardening and this like homesteading life. And it's fun because his giftings are really different than mine. And I am the dreamer and the visionary and he keeps the garden alive. So if it was up to me, the garden would have died like yesterday. So anyway, it works out really great. So yeah. It takes all kinds and all the good. It's true. You know, to make it around. Yeah. Um, it's that true. is so funny. And I so enjoy that you say that because it's almost like the light at the end of the tunnel. I just did a podcast. With, actually, it was someone else's podcast the other day, but... Um, she asked the highest of highs and the lowest of lows and with Shay and in marriage. And 
I actually told her, I was like, Shay and I are at a point now where we're dreaming together. And I just think that that in and of itself is such a gift from God that like, that he knows that like once he's, I mean, sanctification never ends, right? Like in marriage and in life, the the purifying of our hearts and the sanctification, like it's never going to end. But once you go through a few of those really, really dark, and when I say like dark, like the darkest moments of life together, but you're pushing through and you're bringing up babies into this world. And then the common goal is, hey, we want these babies to be citizens of heaven. And more than that, we want them to be warriors for the kingdom of God. Like we want to bring like heaven to earth. We want to like bring hope to the world that is Jesus Christ. Once you get to that place and you've done a lot of the work and you've done counseling and you've done healing, there is this beautiful gift of getting to dream together. And that can sound so silly to people, but I was never a dreamer. Shay's whole family, they're all dreamers. They're all creative. They're all builders. Um, His dad is actually a builder. And that is a gift that he has pulled out in me is the luxury. And it is a luxury to dream, right? Like we Mm -hmm. don't all feel like we're able to for whatever reason, but Shay has pulled that out of me, his whole family really. We can sit down and dream about the future together, dream about our kids' future and the generations to come and and our forever home one day and what it looks like, what life looks like, um, not just with us, but with our kids. And it is such a privilege and a joy. And I think it's like one of God's like little hidden gems in life that we get to do that together now, you know, before, before the millennial reign. So there's yeah. just so much goodness, which, you know, again, a lot of rabbit trails we could go down, but I love that you said that you could dream together and that you are, because I feel like that's very similar to where me and Shay find ourselves. And it is, it's just like, I don't even have words for it. I'm like, it's like, we sit on our front porch in our rocking chairs and just like, what do you want to dream about today? Like, what do you want to dream up? And I don't know. It's just cool. It's just really neat. Well, I love, I lo- I've never thought about that, how dreaming together is like such a gift. Like, but it is. It's such a gift of mm-hmm. God. I love that you added that point. Yeah. I mean, could you have imagined in the dark season, y'all sitting down trying to dream together? No. No, because you were just all. trying to get through it. Like, That's when true. you're in survival mode, think about like <laughs> anything beyond it. If nothing else, I hope that's an encouragement to someone that like beyond like their survival and the getting through, like there's so much to look forward to. Like at times, Shay and I feel like we're already in our grandparent era, you know, like (laughs) we were like, wow, we're out here in our front porch rockers and like life is busy and, and life is complicated and it can be hard, but it's so good. It's so good. And we have this goals. And, and one of the reasons I wanted you on was just because you are such an advocate and a voice for not just family, but like for health and for the ministry that is the family unit. I've done a few episodes. I did one a couple years ago on the gifts of influence is what I called it. And it was based off the seven mountains of influence. Uh, But I opted to call it the gifts because All of us are gifted and we're all going to find ourselves on one or two or three or however many mountains of influence, like whatever our giftings are, wherever God has placed us, there is, there's influence there. And I just think it's so important for everyone, but especially I'm a woman. So I'm like, I love to see other women who are stepping up, who are being vocal. And I think that you do it in such a and inc- I mean, masterful way. You're so funny. Uh, <laughs> seriously, everyone that sends me your reels, which I'm, I never get on TikTok, but I see the reels on Instagram. And so everything that people send me, it's like all of your funny reels. And I was like, Kristen's at it again. She's at it again. <laughs> but the message behind it is, is truth. You know what I mean? Like we can laugh about it, but the truth of the matter is like, Children are a gift from the Lord. They are our heritage. And and it's hard in the throes of things. You're literally homeschooling your kids. And sometimes being set apart and choosing the right thing is the harder thing. And I think that you are an example of that today. Like choosing to 
go out onto land and choosing to homeschool your kids and choosing not to go to the supermarket for every little thing, but like, let's do it. Let's milk the cow. Let's make her butter. <laughs> like, I'm going to have to get with you after this and work on my like bread situation because it's not good. <laughs> You know, we, we all have our times and seasons for things. And there have been many times, actually, when I am pregnant or like have a newborn where my sourdough, I kill my sourdough starter and the kids are like, mom, are you going to make bread again? I'm like, no, probably not. I'm just going to buy it at the store because I cannot do that right now. So we all have our, I was actually talking about this with one of my really good friends the other day about how, you know, we can't do everything at once and we can't do everything all the time. And so sometimes some seasons you kill the sourdough starter and you just are okay with, you know what, it's okay if we don't have homemade bread, you know, we're going to go to Trader Joe's and we're going to get the bread there. And it's going to be great because that's just the season of life we're in. And it's just, yeah, different things in different seasons. It's a balance. And I think it's important too to have grace for yourself. That is something the older I get and the more babies I have, I'm like, some days I'm just looking up and I, I'm not even kidding. One day I felt like God was like, you're a good mom. And I just broke down crying and I'm not a crier, but I think God just knew that I needed to hear that. And also just like, have grace. It's fun. If your kid misses a day of school. It's, it's not the end of the world. Like he's four. It's Mother's Day out. You're not a bad mom for, you know, like we had pneumonia. Everyone had pneumonia a week or two back and I miss appointments and there's just so many things and I'm just like, you know what? We're doing it. We're doing the best we can and mm -hmm. we're late for church almost every Sunday, but <laughs> every Sunday I'm like, we're doing it. But you're there. Yeah. We're still doing it. So that is something fortunately that has come along with older age and also just more kids. And I'm like, you've got to have grace. God has grace for us. So we have to have grace for ourselves. We can't do it all. We can't do everything all the time, just like you said. So yeah. thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, just, you know, I don't know, I think about this a lot, I guess, but you know, the enemy really, I think has a heyday with attacking moms because if you think about the role of a mother and how uh, hated it is by culture, and by the enemy and and then you consider the role of a mother is to it, it says in um uh, I think it's in Proverbs 15 I could be wrong or maybe it's Proverbs 14 it's in it's in a proverb where it talks about how with wisdom she builds her house but with folly she tears it down and we are essentially the thermostat of our home, Abby Halberstadt the uh, she is in is for Mama on Instagram but she talks about that too is that if you consider the role of a mom, only mothers can grow a human and birth a human and then nurse that like be the source of nutrition for that little baby. And so that alone, the fact that God created us to be able to make and sustain life. I mean, you know, he makes life, but for us to grow and sustain life and then nurture it beside of the womb. Uh, and then what that looks like on a daily basis with kids of, you know, we are nurturing them. We are teaching them. We are raising future generations. We are shaping the world like one little soul at a time. And, you know, we might not be out there, you know, speaking to thousands of people or whatever. Like we may literally just be doing the dishes and the laundry in our home and serving our family faithfully. But that is that is a huge game changer. Like we're, you know, raising those, the, the next generation. And of course the enemy would love to like nothing more than to just come and undermine the work of a mom, like to make us feel like we are terrible at what we're doing or to make us feel like what we're doing is not important. And mm -hmm. I, I do think that there are times where the Holy Spirit convicts us because I know that, that there are a lot of times that I sin against my children or against my husband and that the Holy Spirit convicts me to say, hey, let's reevaluate how your attitude is. Mm -hmm. But aside from that, the enemy just comes in and he just wreaks havoc in our minds with the mom guilt and, you know, everything that follows and that you brought that up is like, yes, yeah, like. God has given us this title, this role, our children, our home, 
in his sovereignty because he knew like he has a plan for it. And of course the enemy is going to try to undermine that. And so we just need to tell him to move along and get on because our kids are alive, they're fed and they're being taught the gospel. And you don't know that you're not, you're not raising the next Billy Graham. You know, I think about that all the time too. I'm like, we speak things over our boys all the time. And I'm like, God has plans for you. Like there, you're going to do incredible things for the kingdom of God. And, and you don't know, and that's not why we're doing it. We're not raising our kids because we think that we're raising the next Billy Graham, but you never know. And the impact that you are going to have on future generations Gosh, it really is humbling to think about the part that we play. And also, I mean, it really depends on your algorithm, I guess. But I got sucked down a hole the other day and I saw, and I'm sure you've seen it, but it was like, while the world is going about its business and feminism is raging and, you know, there's all this going on, there, there is an entire generation of women who are doing the quiet work of raising the future and I think about that like I think about that often we're not out there on the front lines we don't our work isn't seen but we are quietly doing the work of raising the future generation and that again I don't think that that's anything that I don't know I don't know how anyone could look at it and be like well you're just you're just a stay-at-home mom or you're just this I have this story that I tell sometimes, but I had someone come over to my house one time and she looked around and she said, so what do you do all day? And it was just, it was really, it was really hard for me to be like, I mean, I was just speechless. Honestly, I was just like, I should have said I go and get a spa day like three days a week and get my toes done. And then after that, I book like a, like I should have told her all this stuff, but I was just like, yeah. you know, if I do explain what a mom does all day, every day, and then through the night too, like, it's fine. It's fine. Yeah. And the world yeah. can see, but also we know what we do. So that's true. You're doing great work. Uh, you are too. So you are too. Where can people find you? What have you got cooking next? And I don't know. I feel like I could see you writing a book or, you know, dabbling in something <laughs> 20 years ahead and I'm just being nosy and, and picking now. What do you what are you dreaming about in the next few years? You are funny and you're really sweet. I feel really buttered up by you. I just little, you just made me blush today with all your encouragement. So actually I was talking to my husband about this earlier. So I started a podcast a few years ago and just wasn't able to continue it just with the season of life. I just felt like, you know, God was just reminding me like to where my focus needs to be. And so it's been a really sweet season, a hard season, but a really sweet season of just literally just focusing my efforts on, you know, homeschooling and just getting our homestead set up and things like that. And so I would love so much and I, it's kind of, it's, it's on the, on the cusp, I think eventually to start the podcast up again. Um, I just, I love it. It brings me joy. It brings me life to do that kind of stuff, to sit down and do things like this, where I get to talk with other people and just share what God has done and who God is and just, you know, even practical application and tips for you know, other moms right now. Uh, so, so that's one of the things that I really am wanting to work on. And then also uh, just, I guess it was last week, maybe, I invited some homeschool moms over on like a Friday morning to have muffins and bring their kids over. And that that's something that I really have a heart for as well is like younger moms and then also just other homeschool moms. Like just, I guess moms, like and just having community because it's so important. And I, I was actually just at a conference this past weekend and it was incredible to see like over 4,000, like to be with 4,000 women all with, you know, just a similar mindset and just stand in solidarity and seeing that Jesus is King. And also to remember that like, we're not alone. Like we all are desiring the same things of raising our children to love the Lord. And so kind of in that same spirit and that same mindset of like, just wanting to gather a community of just young moms and moms who 
want to raise their children to love the Lord and just gathering people together. That I, that's one of my favorite things in the whole world. It lights me up more than anything is bringing people together. And, and I always love, like I had a couple of different friend groups that met and they like ended up loving each other. And I, I just like, I just love when people that I love, love each other. And then we all love each other. And then it's just so fun. I just, I love to be, to bring people together. And so I'm, I'm going to work on something like that kind of nurturing and fostering, like, you know, like a little bit of a community um, like that. Cause it's just needed, you know, it's needed moms. We need each other and we need, we need other moms to call us out, to encourage us, to, you know, share ideas, to just to walk alongside, you know, just to see that our kids aren't the only ones that are feral. Like other people have feral kids too. Um, so, so that's something that's kind of like in real life, but I, I think long-term Justin and I have dreams together of doing family discipleship type stuff together. Um, we have this slogan that we always say together, you know, like make the days count. And I think we, we might want to do something that's kind of centered around that of, just family discipleship, marriage, you know, parenting, all, all that kind of stuff. Not that we think that we're experts, but really just sharing what we've learned and what has worked, um, what hasn't worked, and just encouraging other believers and other families in, you know, like in walking in the way of a biblical family unit and the value that kids are. And, you know, they just, they're so, they're so valuable. And, you know, it takes a lot of sanctification to be a parent. That's probably the most sanctifying thing that God has ever used. Like even, even above marriage, like marriage has been ultra sanctifying, but man, being a parent is like next tier sanctifying, you know, cause at least with your husband, you're like, I like, you're like, I, I didn't need a minute from you. Like if you could just not talk to me for like the next hour, like I just need a minute. It doesn't work that way with kids. Like if you're, you know, all the moms understand. And so anyway, yeah. So I, th- I think that I love that. And I am excited to see, like, I just know that I'm going to see you like launch and merch or something like not too far down the road, just because you have that entrepreneurial spirit. But also I love the heart because you're so right. The thing that like, I think that young moms and also young married women, like it's a, it's a double whammy, but like the feeling of isolation a, if you're struggling in marriage in the early years, and B, if you have a newborn, and C, if it's all of that in one perfect storm. Some of the most isolating years of my life, um, and I literally felt like I had no one. And so community is so important. And I've shared this before, but I actually saw a statistic, and maybe it was a documentary I watched, but like the hundred the people that live to a hundred, there was a study done, and one one of the factors of women, like women were living longer, and one of the factors was that women were more prone to have community with each other. Like that literally extends your life because you develop community, you have people that you can go and you can cry together, you can laugh together, you could you just are doing life together. And I even look at my own family. My mom is one of eight, you know, there's so many cousins, all they, everyone still gets together holidays and candy making seasons. And, and it's just like, I look at these women and I'm like, that is community. That's a sense of belonging in something that money can't buy. Like you just, you know, the world tells us we need a lot of things, but actually what we need is has less to do with anything we can buy and more to do with what can be cultivated with what God's already given us. So I love that you, you know, you see that need and you're ready to answer it. And God has so equipped you for it. I'm excited for you. You're so sweet. You're so sweet. And for any mom that's out there that doesn't have community, that's longing for community. Cause I remember being in this position of just feeling like I want a group of like good girlfriends and like, it sounded silly, but it was like, you know, like a group that would like want to do something for my birthday. You know, like there was a season of life where I didn't feel like I really had that, you know, group of friends where it was like this deep group of, you know, just these deep connections. And I remember praying and asking God, God, 
Will you please give us community, give us good community. And I thanked him in advance, like thank you in advance for the community that you will give us because God desires us to live in community. And so if you're a mom or, you know, you're a single girl or, I mean, or you're young, married, no kids yet, like whatever season of life that you're in, if you are struggling with community and if you're like, I don't know, you know, if community will ever happen, God has designed us to live in community and start asking him for it. You know, God, show me people that you want to put in my life, like put people in my life and thank him in advance and then foster those relationships, you know, be, be the friend that you want to have. And, and, you know, God, God wants to give us those relationships. He does. I mean, I remember a time where I was praying and I would never ask for myself. I'm a nine on the Enneagram. So I'm like, I don't need anything. I have no needs. But I remember praying for God to bring men into Shay's life. And I was like, please, God, just bring these good men into Shay's life. And two weeks later, it's like you said, I didn't write it in my journal, but two weeks later, I mean, I can still tell you like the moment that I could watch men drop one, two, three, four, like into Shay's life. And then right after that, I remember God dropped, like sprinkling women into my life. And I was like, oh, isn't that so like God? Like he was like, I don't mm-hmm. just want to answer this prayer for your husband. Like you need community too. And I'm going to bring you women too. And so you're so right. Start praying um, because God does desire that for us. He desires that for our ch- his children. And it's so good for our children to see us in community with other people who could potentially be a part of their lives growing up. It's so important. That's so good. That's so true. Yeah, God is so kind. Well, anything else you want to share with the people before we wrap it up? I know that you're napping and I'm about to go for school pickup and I'm proud of us that we got this in <laughs> with packed schedules and like almost nine kids between us. Yeah, that's a crazy. Which one are you do? January. January. Again. That's mm-hmm. so fun. If people want to uh, look me up on Instagram, I'm Kristen Nicole Young. It's K R I S T N. I know there's like a million ways you can spell Kristen. It's Kristen Nicole Young. I, there's a warning. I am a little ridiculous on there. So, anyway, I love to marry truth with humor because if you don't laugh, you're going to cry. So, it's fun. I love to make people laugh. I love to share the truth of gospel. Um, so, anyway, that's that. I am so glad that we got to do this and got to catch up a little bit. And I just love watching your growing family too. And so, anyway, just thank you so much for asking me to be on your podcast. Well, thank you for thank you for coming on and for making the time. And we've really not we can't wait another five years to do this again. So All I'll right, text you after. <laughs> okay, that sounds great. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Love you. All right. Bye. I love you. Thank you so much for listening today. If this episode has encouraged you, please feel free to share this show with your family and friends. There's a lot of stuff going on in the world today, and my hope is that this show is a candle in